Hello and welcome to this video on the very first immortal cell line, Healer Cells. Healer Cells originated in the 1950s as a cervical cancer sample. This was taken from a young woman as part of the diagnostic and treatment process. The cells were found to be incredibly long-lived and recoverable. Like bacterial cultures, it could be continually grown. This led to distribution among cancer researchers and a large number of consequential discoveries. The overall story is one that has been retconned into a matter of power, use and consent, but how much of that is true? This video gives the history, context and results of the healer cell line. The origin of the healer cells and many subsequent discoveries owes to Henrietta Lacks, who was born in 1920. In 1951, she presented to John Hopkins Hospital with abdominal pain. The hospital took a biopsy of her cervix, which came back as an epidermoid carcinoma, but was later corrected to an adenocarcinoma. Ultimately, this had no impact on her treatment. It is claimed that two further samples were taken from her without permission, though this practice was standard for the period in question, and even today. These samples gave rise to the healer cell line. After she was diagnosed, Henrietta Lacks was treated with radium tube implants, x-rayed, and told to return for follow-up. Although continuing to be treated, she unfortunately died roughly 10 months after her diagnosis. It is around this time that a biologist called Otto Gay comes in. He noticed that the sample contained cells which could be repeatedly cultured. At this point, human cells of any kind could only survive for days at most. These cells required an extreme effort, meaning little work could be done in compensation for the work put into developing human cells. This substantially impacted on research. By isolating the cells which seemed most resilient, he found they could be grown an infinite number of times as long as they were given nutrition and other basic requirements. This was a substantial improvement on research practices at the time. His research assistant customarily named the cells healer cells after the first two letters of the patient's first and last name. The difference between these cells and those that were used before is longevity and resilience. As noted with the artificial blood video, cells undergo a process of telomere shortening and other genetic damage which leads to a loss of viability and eventually apoptosis when cells are regularly cultured. Healer cells are immortal in that regards. They do not lose viability over successive generations, but will divide and increase in population size. The downside to this is that the cancerous origins of these cells leads to a degree of genomic instability, which causes further mutation over time. This is a far greater rate of mutation than in normal cells. Invariable mutations which will occur because the cell line does not readily die off. That is the first reason that healer cells were such a substantial discovery. The second reason that healer cells are so important in research is the ability to hybridize with other cells. For example, pancreatic islet cells which can produce insulin. This problem was identified as early as the 1970s where this exact phenomenon was observed. By hybridizing cells like this, a comparatively long-lived and stable set of cells can be grown in the lab for a specific course of investigation. The first product or cell line to be developed as a consequence of the healer cell line was Jonas Salk's polio vaccine. This is because the cells would not die when exposed to poliomyelitis. This made it possible to test the vaccine. The development of polio vaccine also gave rise to a facility which could produce healer cells en masse for testing purposes. Naturally, this was then used to produce cells for other researchers when Salk's vaccine was approved for widespread use. The polio vaccine was a major discovery, but if that was the end of the line for the role healer cells have played in research, they would not have developed into what they are now. Healer cells have been cited in more than 60,000 papers, 
and it is estimated another 300 articles come out every month. These articles have covered everything from cloning cells in 1953 to further work on the parvovirus, HIV, and papillomaviruses. They have been central to exploration of cancer. This is especially true of sex steroid tumors. They are also a powerful tool in testing new chemotherapeutic targets and agents. Healer cells are a powerful means of developing new diagnostic and analytical tools. This includes intracellular stains, markers, and antibodies. This means they can and are useful as a means of testing new methods with a relatively low cost, but high efficacy, efficiency, and reproducibility of the methods used. The more novel developments that have gained traction in research over the last few years use these cells. Investigations looking into telomerases, chromosome number, and cancerous gene sequences. This is only a small sample of the research that has, is, and will come from healer cells. You now have some idea of where healer cells came from, and a brief idea of what has been achieved as a consequence. But what of the controversy? This arises from the earlier mentioned pathology samples. A case can be made that without informed consent, the procedures and subsequent events are morally dubious at best. The counter to these arguments comes in two forms. The first is the actions taken to recognise the benefits that came from Henrietta Lacks and the cell line she began. This includes a wide range of concessions from activist scientists. The second counter is legal framework, rights and obligations involved. This is often unknown or ignored. Medical samples like this are legally defined as discarded or waste. A medical facility or doctor takes ownership of it as a result. This is because they are required to dispose of this material. In the case of pathology samples, there is a legal requirement to do so. This is to ensure samples are kept for a number of years in the case of retesting, checking or litigation for pathologists, for disposal as human biological waste in medical services, and other legal frameworks. Even afterwards, samples may be retained as a source of reference material, education or testing. In 2013, the descendants of Henrietta Lacks raised privacy concerns about genomic data being published based on the cells taken from Henrietta Lacks. This is largely addressed through the case of Moore v. Regents of the University of California, which dealt with a very similar matter, the simplified version of which involves a cancer researcher who developed another cell line for research. The courts considered this material to be abandoned and not the plaintiff's personal property. This meant that they had no right to control it afterwards. They had no right to any income or intellectual property rights to go with this. This leaves the hospital responsible for the abandoned things. Most courts have followed this ruling. In the case of healer cells, a substantial concession to the issues raised by the family and others was made by the National Institute of Health. The NIH agreed to give the family greater controls over the cell's dissemination. The primary concerns being that Henrietta Lacks is recognised in publications using healer cells, and the second was that two members of her family are on the committee that oversees access to the genomic data. Hopefully this video has given you some idea of where, what, and the why of healer cells, and why they are both a controversy and a boon to research. Thank you for watching this video. If it has been of interest, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.